Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Get a free 31-page PDF. It's a study guide on the top 200 drugs. I put it together myself, uh, brought together the most important uh, clinical practice pearls as well as the most uh, practical uh, pearls as far as uh, relating to pharmacology exams and board exams. So uh, it's a no-brainer to go grab that, and you can do that at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, let's get into the drug of the day today, and that is Verapamil. Brand name of this medication is Calen. Uh, I've also seen Verilan used. And this drug is classified as a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So if you recall from a podcast on amlodipine, I believe, I think I've done one on nifedipine as well, uh, those are dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. And uh, structurally, obviously, there's, there's some difference there. Um, but from a clinical practice standpoint, the biggest differentiator is that the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil here uh, can affect the heart much more significantly uh, than a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So again, classification is a non-dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blocker, sometimes abbreviated uh, CCB for calcium channel blocker. So you'll definitely see that in practice. Uh, mechanistically, as we think about the classification, calcium channel blocker, uh, verapamil blocks calcium from entering voltage-gated channels uh, in the smooth muscle and heart. Okay, so that's that's again that's that difference versus a dihydropyridine really only affects smooth muscle. Uh, verapamil, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker affects smooth muscle and heart. So by blocking that calcium, that causes relaxation. So what you're going to see from a physiologic standpoint is a reduction in blood pressure and a reduction in heart rate or pulse. So that's going to lead into our uses. You know, why would we use verapamil? Uh, probably most commonly, uh, I've seen it used for uh, atrial fibrillation, management of tachycardia. Again, makes sense. It brings down the heart rate. Uh, other potential options, angina, um, hypertension it can be used for. Typically, if it's just for hypertension, uh, most clinicians are going to uh, lean on the dihydropyridines like amlodipine, for example. You'll see that used way more often uh, for hypertension. And that's really due to the simplicity, a little bit less adverse effects, and obviously you'll avoid uh, that kind of impact on the heart as well. Uh, a couple unique indications. So headaches is a good one to remember. So a prevention of migraines and probably more often that I've seen it used, maybe prevention of uh, cluster headaches. So again, this is prophylaxis, so it's not active treatment, um, but it has been, verapamil has been shown to potentially be uh, helpful there. Uh, dosage forms. This is a question uh, that I have encountered numerous times in, in my practice. There's lots of different dosage forms with verapamil. Uh, diltiazem, one of the other non-dihydropyridine calcium blockers, is actually worse, um, but verapamil has a, a few different dosage forms as well here. So uh, there's the extended release tablet, and that's usually given once or twice daily. And then the extended release capsule that's typically only given once a day. Uh, and then, of course, we have immediate release as well. And that's usually three or four times uh, per day. So now, you know, you'd, you'd maybe ask yourself, well, why would we ever use, you know, immediate release? And uh, the primary example that I've seen in, in practice uh, is somebody with bariatric surgery, potentially, that uh, we've bypassed a portion of the gut, intestine, and so we don't have as much transit time to use an extended release product because the drug will have 
pass through the system before it gets slowly absorbed out of the dosage form there. So that's one situation where I have seen immediate release um, potentially preferred over extended release, but obviously the, the nuisance of that and why in patients with a normal functioning gut we like to use the extended release is you don't have to dose it uh, near as frequently. Uh, total daily dosing, uh, most often you're going to see patients in the range of 120 up to maybe a max of 360, 360 milligrams per day. And then getting into adverse effects, uh, so I've kind of alluded to a couple already, so uh, that drop in pulse, so we've, we've got to be sure to pay attention to that. Uh, drop in blood pressure, which again, if we're using it for hypertension, if we're using it um, you know, to bring down the heart rate, that's obviously intentional, but if it brings it down too much, uh, that definitely could be, be an adverse effect. Uh, probably the two biggest things other than heart rate pulse changes, um, that I've seen in practice is, is constipation. Um, that's probably number one. And, uh, maybe that's more so because I deal with a lot of geriatric patients, uh, more so, but, um, that's definitely one to, to pay attention to. Uh, one other thing I, I have seen occasionally is uh, maybe some lethargy or excessive tiredness. Uh, again, probably most often in situations where dosing was uh, too aggressive too quickly. Um, so again, pay attention to that adverse effect. Uh, and then on the rare side, um, there have been reports of increased uh, LFTs and, and that sort of thing. So uh, thinking about adverse effects and monitoring parameters... Uh, we're going to look at blood pressure, heart rate, obviously, uh, and then possibly LFTs periodically or as clinically indicated if we uh, note that there's any potential uh, liver function issues happening. All right, so a couple situations I wanted to mention. Um, one is obvious, bradycardia. We shouldn't use verapamil if heart rate is already low. Um, again, you're, you're not going to likely run into that when we're using it for cardiac purposes because we're probably paying attention to that. The situation where I've seen it come up in clinical practice is maybe um, you aren't thinking about the cardiovascular effects as much because you're using it for uh, cluster headache prevention or migraine prevention. So again, just paying attention to that, recognizing um, all the actions of the medication is really, really important. Uh, the other major issue to really avoid and, and pay attention to this medication is um, left ventricular systolic dysfunction. So uh, certain types of heart failure. Uh, that's another good situation where uh, in general, we're likely going to try to avoid verapamil uh, if at all possible, because it could um, certainly worsen that condition. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. Hey, nurses out there listening, we've just released a new book. It's on Amazon. It's the MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology. So uh, go check it out. It had lots of nice, nice kind reviews already on it. Uh, it's definitely a, a hefty book, and the, the cost of it right now is really, really cheap. So um, I'd really like a lot of people to uh, have it as a nice resource. Uh, and we've put some bonus questions uh, in at the end of the book as well. Uh, to help you in your uh, pharmacology exams, board exams, and, and get you ready for that. So uh, lots of input from uh, various uh, nursing faculty, nursing students, uh, trying to make it the most relevant uh, I could uh, to your uh, nursing practice and your board exam. So again, MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology, you can check that out on Amazon. Uh, if you're a pharmacist, uh, go support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Uh, we've got a growing list of board certification resources there. Uh, if you're another healthcare professional, we've got books on drug interactions, food drug interactions, polypharmacy case studies. Uh, so again, all those links, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, let's wrap up with drug interactions and... One of the major reasons why I don't like verapamil is it has quite a few drug interactions. And the primary reason being it is a CYP3A4 inhibitor as well as P-glycoprotein inhibitor. Um, but that CYP3A4 action can affect a lot 
of medications. Um, so aripiprazole, uh, simvastatin, atorvastatin, apixaban, uh, several HIV medications, uh, budesonide and some other corticosteroids, buspirone for anxiety, sildenafil, uh, tamsulosin, colchizine, uh, diazepam. So, I, I mean, the list goes on and on. There's many, many more medications too. Um, I just highlighted some of the ones that, that I do see a little bit more commonly in practice. Um, basically, verapamil is going to inhibit CYP3A4, which breaks down or at least partially breaks down uh, some of those drugs I listed there. So concentrations of all those reacting drugs are going to potentially go up and increase the risk of toxicity. Very, very important to look up drug interactions with verapamil if you aren't sure. So run that drug interaction screen, definitely. Uh, other things relating to CYP3A4. So uh, verapamil is broken down by CYP3A4 in addition to inhibiting or affecting it. Uh, so enzyme inducers, uh, carbamazepine, rifampin, those can lower concentrations of verapamil. Meanwhile, CYP3A4 inhibitors, a uh, good example of a, of a non-drug is uh, grapefruit juice. You know, that can inhibit CYP3A4, which can increase concentrations of verapamil, and you might end up in a situation where patient has a drop in blood pressure or clinically significant drop in pulse uh, due to getting a higher concentration of the drug in the body there. Uh, and then, of course, we've got additive effects. So constipation, think about that. Um, I mentioned that as a potential adverse effect. So if you've got uh, opioids, anticholinergics, those can certainly have additive effects. Uh, drop in pulse. Uh, so if we're, you know, doing amiodarone, digoxin, other antiarrhythmics, beta blockers, uh, maybe a drug like an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor like denepazil, uh, those can all potentially have additive effects where we lower that pulse further. So something to pay attention to there. And then, of course, the, the blood pressure uh, dropping risk as well. So you put a patient on uh, sildenafil, for example, for sexual dysfunction, and that's a medication that can drop blood pressure and have that additive effect to verapamil. So again, want to emphasize, if you're not sure with verapamil and the drug interactions, you definitely got to look it up because there are a lot with this medication. And it's one of the big reasons why uh, you don't see a ton of verapamil being used out there. All right, well, I think that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. If you found this episode helpful, uh, do us a huge favor. Uh, leave us a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, should only take you, you know, 10 to 30 seconds quick to jot something down and, and hit the uh, stars you want there. So greatly appreciative to those of you who have done that and who have sent me emails and comments and things like that, suggestions. Um, you can do that, mededucation101 at gmail.com. And then, of course, go sign up, reallifepharmacology.com. Simply an email will get you access to that free uh, top 200 study guide. Again, 31 uh, full pages, uh, PDF. Great resource for those out in practice or those taking pharmacology exams or, or board exams. All right, well, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day.